So, good evening everyone and welcome to the planning meeting of the 25th of July 2022. The first item on the agenda is apologies and we have received apologies from... Councillors Bennett, Lights and Snow. Thank you. Um, and the second item on the agenda is the minutes of the last planning meeting, which was the 25th of April. Uh, is everybody happy that this is a true and accurate representation of the meeting? Yes. Who were there? Yes, because the committee has changed. You happy? Yeah. Right, I'll sign those later. Uh, uh, item three is declarations of interest. I imagine all of you know how that works, but should you have a pecuniary or personal interest, please declare it before the meeting uh, the item is spoken about. And we don't have any under items under the Local Government Access to Information Act, exclusion of the press and public. So item five on your agenda is planning application number 211564 out for the former police station and magistrates court on Hebertrees Road. Due to a late representation from a statutory consultee, uh, we have decided to defer this item so that we have all the information when it's brought to committee and we, I would like to say, hope it's coming to the next one, but it might be the one after that. So that item has been taken off the agenda, which uh, means that the meeting probably be a little bit shorter. So item six is planning application number 210496 which is land at Ikea Way, Exeter, and Howard Smith is planning presenting on that. Thank you, Chair. So it's an application for 184 dwellings on the piece of ground opposite the entrance, opposite the car park of Ikea, between the A379 and the railway line and the residential development of the south of Ikea. Um, to, the, to the bottom here you can see resident dimension development on Beach Close, on Mulligan Drive and on Bunker Square, which we refer to in the car park and the site boundary. You can see the A379 to the north, see the railway line, and right in the top of the screen you can see the road bridge over the A379. Sorry, um, sorry, would you go to Stanton Point by Bunker Square? So this is Beach Close, this is part of Mulligan Drive, and this is Bunker Square. Okay. Uh, so this is looking out from here towards the site to the site boarding at the car park and the rising land beyond. The land levels were uh, raised with uh, excavation material from Ikea, which is on the site, uh, much of which would be cleared. So looking slightly to the left there, you can see the A379 on the left. This is looking from uh, one of the highest points of the site that uh, the level being raised back towards the road coming down the Kia which will actually go straight on and be the entrance to the site. This is beach close. Uh, the, uh, the land levels on the left will be reduced and there is landscaping on the right of the boundary that will come in. This is looking on the edge of the car park. I'll talk about this is from the end just inside the inside of the entrance to the site the main thing uh, looking across the back of that hoarding. The centre of the site will appear on the right. You see some of the, uh, sort of land level changes where the, the, the loop of road is removed and material has been stored. Uh, this is old riding close. This is from the southern end. The corner of the site is on the left. And the, uh, the site of the footway and uh, the right hand side of the site. So looking back to the north, uh, from Russell Way, looking back over the bridge towards the site and to ride it close. You can see the, the houses in Bunker Square and beyond that, uh, Mulligan Drive. You can't quite see the house in Peter Close on the right. So this is um, Bunker Square, looking towards Mulligan Drive. You see the, the entrance to the site from the, from the Ikea Road just on the left there. You can see the difference in levels, some of which will be reduced. 
you see the landscaping down here in the uh, area of open space in front of it. The proposals were amended uh, to remove an access, pedestrian access. Looking back from 379 to the bridge on the far end of the site, and the site is this boarded area in uh, Keir Tarpon. Looking the other direction from under the bridge, just see the, uh, the elevated bridge level. The 181 buildings access is from Ikea Way, restricted access back up onto the bridge with buses only, and pedestrians and cyclists have three points of access uh, to Hog Rising Close, which runs north south through the uh, eastern boundary of the site. Within the development of the multi-use games area, it's for a deep standard play, um, play area and two flat standard play areas and would definitely include two bus stops. So this is the layout. Clear car park on the left. Existing residential to the south. It's the old ride close, passing through the loop road and the bus only gate to access the bridge. Shows building heights of the darkest on three story, and the lightest of two story. It's a mix of uh, flats and houses. So there are 184 dwellings, 47 flats, 137 houses, and predominantly two and three bed. So there are 59 two bed, 102 three beds. But that's there, that's the next. So the adopted roads plan. So loop roads access through the site have been adopted. Bus stop area. Uh, that can come out very well with a drainage strategy just to show how the site will be drained and where the attenuation tanks are, how the car parks and under the multi use games area. There's also a, a surface water attenuation feature at the bottom corner of the site. Just very quickly to flick through and come back to any of the other ones, but there are a series of flat layouts. So these, this is the type of flats along the arranged sequence along the boundary with IKEA. <coughs> showing ground floor layout, so they have rear access into an area of common or private space behind the building and front access onto the road. People sign the flats. Some flats have garages. Small numbers of those. Those of those. Three story housing. Three stories are used at focal points and around the entrance to the site. So these are some street views. On the bottom is the view from IKEA car park. Access to the site and continuation from IKEA way. These are actually backs of flats, but there'll be landscaping scheme, uh, fencing, screening. <coughs> this is the views cross section through. This is the IKEA car park and this is the site. So you see how the, the, the road rises up as it goes into the site. Three story building from that location. Randry. And some internal street scenes to the other side. Cross sections. So, so the middle one is a cross section looking through to IKEA car park on the right, three story flat box and two story houses within the site. This is a cross section through to the A379. In this location, the land levels are reduced. This is section through the access to the site, and this is the house on Nottingham Drive. So, key issues. Uh, the recommendation to approve. The application has been, uh, it's a repeat application, the previous one uh, ended up to appeal. And the appeal was upheld on a number of matters, including the absence of uh, small children's play areas, and some points on design and relationship with buildings. Those matters have uh, been resolved. Now, uh, Queen's Committee, with the recommendation for approval, does have 10% uh, site of open space. It has a policy compliant 35% uh, 
affordable housing offer and for 64 dwellings. So that's what we have had since it was re advertised in the new layout in January, we had five objections to that point to do with the bridge, um, the inclusion of uh, buses over the bridge, which people felt was a safety issue. They wanted that to be pedestrian only. To do with density, with some people in the area feeling the density was too high. To do with the provision of cycle uh, facilities within the site. And to do with the height of some of the blocks of housing at three stories. And there is a part of the recommendation if the section 106 isn't completed within six months for me the application to be reviewed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Howard. Does anybody have any questions for Howard? I'm going to start with Councillor Powell, then Councillor Moore, and then Councillor Sutton, because that's the order I saw you make. So my, my question is due to my ignorance on what um, SEDEM's SEDEMS payments are and LEAP and MUGA. SEDEMS are the uh, payments to habitat improvement uh, because the development of people who are in the country and other places that are environmentally sensitive. So there is a scheme in place to collect them up to carry out the improvements to uh, reduce the impact on particularly the extension. Leap is a local equipped area for play, so it's a slightly larger play area, and the mug is a multi use games area. So that's the multi use games area. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Moore, just for reference, can you switch off your feed? And there, are, um, there is an acronym explaining the more agenda sheet. Thank you. Can you just talk me through the cycling and walking, please? Um, and so the road layout, there's different colour roads. Are they, um, so the ones in the middle, are they actually prioritising pedestrians? Are they really slow roads that pedestrians and cyclists can go down without speeding? And what what measures are there around the loop road to keep traffic speeds low? And are there pavements all around way around because it doesn't look like there are? So I just would like to know, and I would like to know about the relationship between um, how people get from the middle of the estate onto the cycle routes. Thank you. So first of all, there is a the colouring is to do with the surfaces in, in this plan. So there is a main access route which is has the accommodates buses, goes through the site, and then there's a bus only gate through this point. At this point, there is a constriction in terms of the road width, change of materials, as there are to the entrances to all these roads which are shared surface. There are pedestrian links through, through the site, so you can have easy access out. There are then three points of access onto the pedestrian cycle route on ride and close. This direction, but yes, we do feel that the design of it, the short lengths of straight, the, the features within the street of, of changes in surfaces, changes in levels, changes in direction, would result in low speed. And this be you know suitable speed for people walking and cycling, safe. Councillor Sutton, thank you. Yes, I, I, I note the um, pedestrian cycles and, and a bus gate on to the bridge over the A379. Um, how is that going to operate that will only allow buses? I'm just mindful of um, issues we've had with Rise and Bollard and other places in the, the, the city. I think the initial proposal is that it will operate on a signage basis only and in a lot of places that is very effective. Um, you're right, bollards have caused us all manner of problems and we don't go for rising bollards anymore. Where we, If we get an enforcement problem then we are moving towards um, enforcement cameras which can be really effective. So that, that would be, you know, it would be monitored and if there was an issue then uh, I think that was probably what we would look to. 
um, I've got a long list of people, so just so everyone knows, I've seen you. You've got Bialik next, then Mitchell, then Hannaford. Councillor Bialik? Actually, mine's more of a constitution, not a question. Thank you, well done for... Noticing the difference. Uh, Councillor Mitchell. Thank you. Mine is a question. Uh, could I ask some questions about car parking? Uh, you've got parking and access on page 96, where you uh, state that car parking is accommodated in small parking courts and on plot and on site in a manner um, that limits domination of the public realm. Could you tell me how many spaces are allocated per property? And secondly, in relation to many estate roads we see on modern estates, people, because of lack of parking, are forced to park the roads, uh, the cars on the um, highway as such, and often we find then that emergency vehicles, etc., can't get through if vehicles are parked on both sides. So is there sufficient room on this to accommodate the traffic you think will be generated by this development and also allow access for emergency vehicles? I would have to come back to an exact numbers, but the majority of three and four bedroom houses have two parking spaces. The majority of two bedroom houses and flats have one parking space. There is, there is a variety of forms of um, parking on the site. It was something that when this application in its previous form went to appeal, we did argue with the inspector, we weren't 100% happy with it. It has been improved, but also the inspector was minded to say that the parking solution was acceptable. So we are mindful of that in what we recommend. Um, we'll come back to you on the exact numbers, but but it is with it in accordance with our parking standards. They are also all provided with cycle storage, either in a cycle store for the flats or in a uh, in a shed in the garden for the house. Councillor Hannaford. I'm not sure if I'm going to want to use this or not. That's it. That's not too bad. Um, first question. Um, is in regard to the presentation you said that a walkway was um, taken out because of representations that were made um, I'm just doing really going to query that because I'm thinking you know as a sustainable development you know I know young people children going to school making friends you know how, how this interfaces with the existing developments people on the existing development walking through you know building links you know each, each this block isn't going to be people are going to know other people are in the in the existing blocks, aren't they? And, and should we really be stopping up where people can just nip through to see friends and family or people that they know? Um, so just just to really query that, I mean, um, it, it seems to go counterintuitive to what we're trying to do about you know people, you know, linking up and, and building a community. And a, a more broader point on 3.0, there's reference to the extra local plan and the extra core strategy. Um, clearly this is a, a sort of missing piece of the jigsaw in developing this part of the city um, but um, what's happened to the, the, the plans to provide some sort of traveller provision in this part of the city I can remember when this part of the city was being redeveloped and I was in this room and I made a decision with others to um, look at some sort of traveller provision on this side of the city um, and it was very controversial but we stuck to our guns and we, and we I think Texas Sutton was here then were you not I think on that one um, uh, and um, so, so where, where are we with that because you know we seem to be building a lot of houses but where's, well, where's the traveller provision because some of us have had quite a lot of problems recently and uh, having some decent traveller provisions within Exeter would be a very good thing. Okay I'm going to let Howard answer that. Um, first of all in terms of the cut through I mean you're right normally we seek to um, increase mobility and make Sort of walking easier. The cut through is actually in this location where there's a, a change in levels. And to make that safe, you then need good sight lines around it, so you need to take the landscaping out. So at the moment you've got at the moment you've got sort of a dense landscaping bound and a change in levels here. There's all there is provision to walk around, there is access around in this location, there is access through around in that way. And we just felt with the multi-use games area there, with the potential for sort of anti-stage behavior and so on, and the fact that there were other ways around, the fact that we did have representations, though these people were very concerned about it, we felt there was enough permeability, and actually putting that through on balance, it was probably better not to. So yes, I would agree that normally it is, but in this case, we've taken the view that actually it's probably better not to do that. Um, in terms of Gypsy and Traveller sites, I do recall the new core master plan had uh, identified a location in it, and that, but that was down on Tuxham Road, so it wasn't on this site. Um, and we have uh, 
that hasn't been taken forward. There is a review of the need for gypsy and travellers pitches as part of the extra local plan, which is going through the process of the month. And just to follow up on that a bit, in 2010, when the coalition government took over, they took away the need to provide gypsy and traveller sites. That was reintroduced in 29 following consultation 2019, which is why we're looking at it now, because it's now relevant to policy making. Um, I've got Councillor Jobson, I've got Councillor Moore. If anyone else thinks they've got a question, put up your hand now, because I'm not going to take any more after that, otherwise we'll be here all night. You, sh you sure you've got one? You're not just putting up your hand from the front yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Sure. Okay, uh, Councillor Jobson. Thank you. Um, two things really. The um, multi-use games area is sort of isolated from the site itself. I see in the report references to lighting in due course, uh, but there is already uh, there are already complaints about antisocial behaviour and cited where it is. What? Um, uh, Remuneration is going to be put in place to try and prevent it becoming somewhere where um, antisocial behaviour uh, takes place. And it is a shame that there's even a use for buses on that open bridge. It's quite a uh, narrow junction into the roundabout on Russell Way there. Um, surely it would be better to leave that for pedestrians and cyclists and to take buses and all other motor vehicles four-wheeled and two-wheeled. Again, there's um, complaints about um, the area being used by um, boy racers or possibly girl racers. Is that a question? Yes, the drops them. Thank you. Uh, about um, people racing on motorbikes and... Uh, question. The question is, is it not better for the bridge to be properly secured and um, not to be used by vehicle, vehicle and traffic for the so I'll just come back on the multi-use games area. It, it's, a, it's a balance where you cite it to avoid antisocial behaviour by being visible enough and have enough natural policing um, versus being too close to people's houses. So the location we've got here, it does meet the standards of separation recommended by Sports England, 30 metres from the houses behind. There will be a landscape in between. And it's closer to these houses, but they do have a a solid frontage and this would be well overlooked so it is striking that balance we feel between you know the, the problems and how you actually combat them as well through natural surveillance. The bus, the bus is fine, yeah. It's an interesting question is it better? Um, the honest answer is it depends whether you're a cyclist or a bus user I guess. If, if you're a cyclist then you may prefer there not to be buses using it. If you're a bus user, then obviously you want more permeability. Um, I think the balance is probably right to have both uses because the level of bus use is not going to be high. You know, you're, you're never going to get more. Than... <laughs> you're, you're, you're never going to get more than a few an hour. So, you know, the potential for conflict, and obviously we'll look carefully at the uh, the detailed design. Um, the potential for conflict, I think, is fairly low, and obviously a fairly low speed environment as well. Thank you. I have to agree with the comment about the mugger as someone who has one very close to houses. Apparently, the noise that it makes when it hits a garage door is quite significant when a ball has been kicked quite hard. So, it is a, it's a, one of those balances that are difficult to make. Councillor Moore. Thank you. I um, just want to pick up on the comment, Howard, that you made about the, the, the site is. Um, already has the um, spoil from uh, IKEA on it. Um, so I assume that the um, developers will um, use cut and fill and dispose of the waste on site rather than taking IKEA's waste to landfill. And my second quick question is, in your report it doesn't mention anything about Net Zero 2030, which um, that plan is a material consideration in planning terms. So I just would like a comment on um, to what extent it achieves that Thank you. Thank you. If you look at the photograph here, the, the levels the levels on the site did vary before um, spoil was put on top of it. Um, I think it will involve taking material off the site, is my understanding. That's a question probably best put to the applicant exactly how much. Um, I don't think it's all of that material, but there was a substantial amount of cut from IKEA and to make a successful place, 
and to get the uh, appropriate relationships with the surrounding houses, it will be necessary to, to reduce some of the levels in some places, which will not be material being taken. And yes, the net, net zero document is a material document. It should have been listed um, after the development plan documents in section 12. Um, it's a it's a sustainable urban site. It's got good access to, to transport. Um, it is a it is a uh, allocated site. It's a suitable site for development. Um, the, the you'll see there are um, questions from people about uh, the density from people around who think that density is too high. It is only uh, 33 to 35 dwellings a hectare, but that density it's it's you know it's, it's pushing up against uh, what people would like to see there. Um, it does have um, bus through it, so it does make provision for bus use, it does make provision for cycle use, it um, is close to a railway station. The, um, the building uh, performance is conditioned on to secure the best we can in terms of uh, environmental performance, in terms of energy use from the buildings. But yes, we do feel it's uh, doing what we can at this point in terms of this site. It was allocated through the core strategy and through the new court uh, master plan. And Councillor Asma, Asmashin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we'll oh, hold it. Oh, hold it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, please feel free to tell me after I say anything that is over. Uh, there's a bit in here about NHS GP surgeries contribution. It's 107,375. Is that annual? No, that's just a one-off payment. Is that doesn't seem like an awful lot to me. Um, perhaps we could have someone take time to explain that to me. And also there was something a bit earlier that we haven't mentioned about burden back boxes and how they want to put um, the ones for dual use. Um, does that come up as something that is going to be changed at some point, please? So in terms of GP surgeries, it is a contribution to the extra floor space needed in the local GP surgery. So it is you know, money is taken from each development to help expand the physical building uh, rather than from the services. Um, third box. Yes, yeah, sorry. So there is a condition for uh, um, a management plan and, and for the details to be agreed. There are various comments made in about the provisions that are in the application. We will work on, on making sure those are uh, approved and acceptable through the condition. Thank you very much. As I said, I'm getting then to the questions now. So I'd like to call forward one of the speakers for this evening, which is Alex Graves, who is speaking in favour of the application. And you get three minutes and we'll interrupt you when you get to that point. I didn't want to say high tech when I was asked here, which button I'd have said. I didn't either. I didn't want to say. Okay, understood. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Chair and members of committee, I speak on behalf of the applicant in support of your officer's recommendation. This site is allocated for development. Members first granted planning permission for up to 220 houses in 2014. That permission lapsed and there have been several unsuccessful proposals since. Exeter City is constrained, surrounded by sensitive landscape, the threat to which is very real given the difficulties in meeting housing need. This site is a rare thing. Unprotected land with no particular landscape sensitivity. This development would not only assist the council in meeting its housing needs, but in doing so, it would also reduce, reduce the risk to other more sensitive sites. The applicant has worked closely with the council and the county council for over two years, the result of which is before you. Dialogue has continued throughout and the success of these efforts is demonstrated by the fact that the latest scheme has generated far less objection than previous versions. The proposal includes a range of community benefits, 64 affordable homes, public open space, including a multi-use games area to serve the whole community, a two-way bus route linking into the bridge over the A379, which will be to the benefit of the wider community, and in excess of 350 new trees. In addition, the proposal will deliver a cumulative Section 106 and seal package in excess of £2 million. 
the access is the same as that approved in 2014 and the internal roads, the footpath and cycleway connections and parking have been agreed after detailed discussions with County Highways. The applicant has worked closely with the local lead flood authority to ensure that flood risk will not increase on site or elsewhere as a result of development. The layout includes two, two and a half and three storey homes at a mid-range density. The appearance of the houses reflects traditional local character. Walls will predominantly comprise a variety of red brick, multi-brick and white rough cast render with tile roofs. Landmark buildings are used, particularly on the western edge, to respond to the IKEA store and the car park. Extensive landscaping will ensure assimilation into its surroundings. The positive benefits in this case, principally the delivery of much needed housing, both market and affordable homes, along with the associated benefits, weigh greatly in the scheme's favour. I ask that you support your own expert officers and approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you be happy to answer questions? Should anyone have any for you? Happy may be an exaggeration, but I'm here to answer questions if, if asked. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Councillor Mitchell, then Councillor Moore. Uh, thank you. Uh, you might not be able to answer this one at this stage, but would like some reassurance. In regard to our net zero 2030 agenda, as most local authorities have with 2050 and the state of the government, uh, do you assume there'll be a gas supply to this site, or do you intend to introduce heating pumps to each property? And what uh, steps are you taking in regard to solar panels being fitted on buildings? Okay, well, it's, in terms of gas supply, I don't have a precise answer, but I think the answer will likely be yes, in terms of supply. There is a planning condition imposed, or, or the local authority is seeking to impose a planning condition to try and um, introduce carbon reduction. So there will be the possibility of things like solar panels and what, what have you through that. So in allowing this scheme, the authority aren't ceding control on that matter. Ultimately, Exeter City will have the final say in terms of what's acceptable in terms of carbon reduction on site. Um, so if this was approved, then there will be a need to meet that condition. Councillor mm -hmm. Moore. Um, thank you very much. I, I don't note that condition in our um, our set of uh, papers, so perhaps um, I, are you confirmed that you would be, con con this is not my actual question, I just want to follow up, content to have uh, such a condition added. So that was my first question, which is a bonus question. Um, <laughs> so you've had heads up on my other questions. So um, um, to what extent will you be complying with um, the county's waste policy, um, which particularly highlights the importance of cut and fill, i.e. disposing of builders' waste on site? How much of IKEA's landfill are you in, um, waste are you intending to take to landfill? Um, and is there any other comments that you'd like to make? on achieving um, the development as net zero, not, not just the site which we heard about from Howard. Thank you. Um, in terms of conditions, certainly the conditions as originally drafted did include um, the requirement of carbon reduction through sub calculations and a reduction versus the building regulations requirements. I'm aware from the update sheet there have been some changes to conditions and I've not reviewed those in detail to see whether that's still a conditional not, but I understand that it is, but I'll, I'll ask how it's confirmation of that. Yes, condition 13, page 120. Is that, sorry, is that the answer to all the questions? It's fair, fair to say with this site, the, the changing levels and the compacted soil have been a, a great challenge throughout. And it, well, I suppose my starting point would be to clarify clearly from the developer's perspective, uh, cutaway is, is extremely expensive. Expensive is something they're, they're quite keen to avoid, and less essential. Um, so the starting point has been very much a case of trying to reuse whatever can be reusing, you've reused on site. Um, it's fair to say that has caused us a few challenges. One of the main issues with the previously refused scheme was actually the site levels and the concern that development would have on adjoining houses because of the high levels with development on it. So so again, that's something that was a, a consistent theme over the last couple of years, and we, we, we've worked hard to try and write the strike, strike the right balance in terms of what is retained on site and getting the levels to a, a point that the authority officers are, are content that it doesn't impact on neighbours. 
um, as I understand it, there was, it was a huge figure, as part of the construction of the IKEA store, there was in excess of 100,000 cubic metres of spoil put on the site. Clearly, removing that is a hugely expensive um, exercise. I know through the current scheme, the aspirations are to reuse in the region of sort of 20,000 of that on site. Now, in terms of the spoil that may need to be removed from site, as a volume builder, Vistria also have opportunities to try and reuse you reuse that where they can on other development sites. Now, I, I can't give any assurances or precise figures on that. Ultimately, I suppose the answer is it's inevitable there will be some cart away that cannot be reused. But certainly from the applicant's perspective, it's their desire to reuse as much as they can because ultimately it does save them save them money. Councillor Sutton. Thank you, yes. Um, Alex, I note on page uh, 102 the RSPB's comment um, around uh, bat boxes and bird boxes and, and they, uh, they make the comment there that, um, that they are disappointed that the ratio uh, remains uncha unchanged and recommend universal boxes and ask that consideration um, will be given to that. I mean, have the developers looked at that? Are you willing to make that commitment or do we have to put it in as a condition? Again, I'll defer to how, but I think there is a condition on there regarding bat and bird boxes. So again, post, post decision, that would be agreed by the local authority. So, so officers would need to be content with the provision being offered. That's correct, because we haven't, haven't been happy we put a condition on for the um, environment. Landscape and Ecological Management Plan. So I check my acronym. Um, that's condition 40. Yeah, so that, that allows us to obscure details. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, Councillor John. Sorry. One last question. Um, it's the Oak Bridge. Um, the plan seems to me to sort of wait and see and hope that they can dispose of rules. Would it be possible to have a condition in that um, a camera goes in so that that route can be monitored to make sure that that is only to start? In many ways, it's something we defer to, to Mr. Hensley and the High Authority on. But I, I appreciate the starting point is usually signage, which has proven with other bus lanes to be very effective. Clearly, if it does become an enforcement issue, then that. More of a fortunate position to, to put a deposit down and, and, and get into home ownership, and of course, I'm sure we'd all welcome the um, the, the allocation of, of disabled accommodation as well, which is which is very important. Um, I note the officers have said that this is a sustainable site. I think it is. Um, it's very much in the master plan, and it, it fits in. This this land was always going to be down for, for for development, and I think it should be developed. Quite frankly. Um, and I also think that the um, the issue about sustainability is not just about um, in the broader sense, but actually being sustainable. As in, we're taking we're housing people, providing homes near places of work, near the near the industrial estates where the work actually is in Exeter, which again cuts out all the all the the, the commute and, and and the travel to work situation. Um, I, I did have a wry smile about the issue about density um, from St Thomas, for example. I will say that's mitigated by the fact that. The Victorians and Edwardians had big parks, but I mean, density from our point of view um, is an interesting concept. But I, and I also want to just touch upon the fact that of the design of it as well. It will be dark later on, December time, winter times. Where do these cycle labels go, and what is the county, Brian, doing about to making sure you get it all the gold plated? Um, cycle lanes in that pack, but they've got to go somewhere, they've got to go somewhere. Are we recognising where they go? Are we improving the access to actually make make it sustainable to say to people, actually, yet yeah, you can cycle to and from there, it's a good location, but you know, you cross that bridge, I'm telling you, you need to get some of the trees cut down on the other one, by the way. Going through there, it's not particularly pleasant for cyclists at any time. So what are we doing? I'm not saying that the developer is going to put all your cycle lanes right, but we should be looking at that. And I would suggest, if I can, to the county, we ought to think about how we maintain the cycle routes going forward. Thank you, Chair. Otherwise, I would support it. Now, whether or not that can be encompassed somehow, Chair. 
gonna go across the Brian. I have seen the council in the chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, the easy bit is always getting the bits right in the site. It, it's it's putting together the pieces of the jigsaw as you try and link all the different sites. So I, I, I completely agree with uh, Councillor Bialik's point. Um, we, we have sought a contribution of £500 per dwelling towards sustainable transport infrastructure. So that contribution will go towards looking at that type of thing. Um, but it's something that our transport planning team are, are looking at all the time. And uh, we've just made a new appointment to that team, uh, a chap who's quite a specialist in cycling. And um, so, yeah, it's something that we, we will be looking at. We're always looking at. And, and it's trying to make the most of the opportunities as they arrive. And with sites like this, picking up the contributions where we can and where they meet the tests of planning to, to try and make that happen. Can I, just, just to come back on, if I can have a commitment, because that's why I saw the 500 pounds for the sustainable yeah. stuff it coming forward, and can I invite Brian and any other councillor to join me on my bike in daylight to find a way back from there on what I call decent cycle routes. And I think you'll find it reasonably difficult and then imagine what it would be like late at night or when it gets darker when it will do at four or five o'clock at night so so if i can have that commitment chair i'd be more than happy to support i don't think i could condition taking brian out <coughs> but um, i'm sure he'd be quite happy to come along with us at some point and we'll, we'll, we'll get something in the diary that's the i'm sorry we interrupted you yeah. joyful to hear mr council by Alec, as always um can we <laughs> What concerns me is that we want high standard developments in Exeter, we want quality homes that people can live in and are in some, to some extent are future proofed. And I'm just concerned to get reassurance from the planning officers uh, that when we look at future carbon footprints of uh, these buildings and other sites and other developments that take place because uh, we constantly talk about passive house standard in our own building and similar <coughs> point etc. Uh, I am concerned that by the time this development gets built we're just building the standards of 20 years ago. We haven't got trouble gazing, we haven't got heat pumps, we've got no guarantee there's not going to be gas in the properties. Um, by the time 2050 comes along these will be redundant housing in, in climate change uh, under current climate change conditions and I just wonder to what extent we can encourage developers to build to a higher standard that future proofs these houses against future standards. Um, I'm not going to say this isn't relevant to the application because it is, but I'm going to, from a planning point of view, as someone who sat through a lot of Liberal Exeter stuff and the local plan is it's all moving into that city plan as we go forward. Um, the, the entire vision that we are trying to put together is to put some meat on the bones of that because you know as well as I do that planning wise that's not going to stand up as a reason to object for it so we are through the local plan trying to create a vision that is much more sustainable that expects more and that we're doing that but in, in the case of these applications what we're working with at the moment national planning guidance is not particularly I'm, I'm not wishing to object to the application I no. just want our planning no, no. team to get the best standards they can for the people and they, to, they are paying a third of the money for this I feel a bit sorry for the planning officers in front of you because they're not the planning officers <laughs> writing the plan they're the ones working with right. it at the moment but it's, it's a perfectly good point and I think it's one we are reflecting through our local plan at the moment. And as we're saying, we, the local plan did have a policy, and yet we, 2016 we would have been um, zero carbon. And the government said they didn't want it to do the council to do that through planning. They wanted it to be done through the building regulations, and they would update the building regulations. That was in 2016. That update was the first update was supposed to happen. It's just coming in this year. So the, the delay that government took off from us, you know, is, is why we are seeing applications which are being required to be above national standards still, but only slightly above national standards, but that's what we can do. I think Councillor Hannaford, Bialik and Sutton are looking very smug at the moment because they were here in 2016. <laughs> um, right then, I'm going to take this, uh, we've had it, uh, what did you do with it, Rob? I moved you moved it, thank you. Good the recommendation to approve. Oh, did you want to speak, Councillor Ward, second? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do think there has been a very good point made about the um, the buses and stopping traffic over these. So I would like an additional condition to have a camera in put in from the beginning because getting stuff put in retrospe retrospectively is extraordinarily mm. difficult for any community. And I actually think this is really very important yeah. that it's very clear from the beginning this is buses only 
and pedestrians and cyclists. And so I would I would um, want want to see that. I mean, as for the development, I don't have a problem with great density. I would like to say to the de developer to, to reflect upon that only 10% of the uh, site is allocated to green space, and if there was less space allocated to car parking, then there'd be more space for more trees and green space, which would contribute towards net zero targets. Anyway, so I'd like to move that um, additional conditions. Okay, I'm going to check with how reasonable and all the legal tests will go with that. So that's why I've got Howard and Brian and this list at the end of the table. But we don't think that would meet the test for a condition. We think the best way to do that is through the two se two, section 278 agreement, but there is a cost to the developer and that's to be justified. So, question to the applicant, are they willing to fund that through the section 278 agreement? I, as chair, I'm going to suggest that that's a conversation we have outside of the uh, meeting. I would very much hope that that's something we could succeed with, but I don't think it's something that we can overturn the decision upon, that we could not allow the decision to go forward with and stand a chance. So I'm going to ask very nicely that you have that conversation, and I hope the developer will have very open ears to it. Uh, Councillor Sutton, did you want to speak or did you want to second? Um, I am happy to second, but I would like to make contributions as well. Um, and really, just to, not not so much looking smug as looking um, somewhat um, exasperated. I, I, I think um, about national government's um, tardiness um, about taking net zero issues seriously. Uh, it, it, it's a frustration, and I do agree with um, with Councillor Mitchell. We are in danger of building homes that not only are not going to be fit in 10 years time and quite possibly won't be fit for purpose in five years time and I think it's a great shame uh, that the volume um, house builders and developers are much more focused on uh, short-term profits for their shareholders um, than they are on um, actually building the best they possibly can because the cost of putting in um, ground source heat pumps as an alternative to, uh, to mains gas and solar panels and very efficient windows um, is marginal at the construction point um, but the point at which you have to start retrofitting it it becomes hugely expensive so so um, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a whinge um, because legislation doesn't enable us to put in the conditions that we would very much want to um, but also it, it is a request um, along with the other request to the developers to, to give this consideration because I think uh, changes in climate, which we, we're becoming um, even more conscious of, mean that people are likely to be more willing to consider paying slightly more for their homes if they think that um, they're not actually um, going to be regretting the purchase in a few years' time or, or themselves um, <coughs> looking at the cost of retro, retrofitting. So, um, thank you. But having said that, um, I do think it's a sustainable site and I will second it. Uh, recommendation thank you okay i'm going to take this to the vote but first of all i'm going to apologize to councillor branston who was also a councillor in 2016. yeah you seconded it that's why i know but i did uh, i listed all the councillors who would have been part of that local plan and i forgot you richard so. okay. all right then could i have all those in favor please Oops. eight in favor uh those against one against and any abstentions Thank you very much. That's the end of that item, which is now carry. Uh, so we are now looking at Planning Committee Report 220314 and 220384 listed building consent, which is for redevelopment of Hallian's building, including the demolition of existing extension of the webinar, which I think the officer might fill us in on. <laughs> Um, it is a 64 bed older person's care home uh, following demolition of extensions to Mr. Pilkin. Okay. Includes creation of a new access onto Pinhoe Road, car parking, landscape, drainage, and other works. So, this is the site on Pinhoe Road. 
to the entrance to Brooklyn Village, on the crest of the hill. People may be familiar with Honeylands, <coughs> Paul's Lake Ridge Station <coughs> is off to the west. If you've got the existing building in the centre of the site, which has an access through Mammacroft Drive and through Honeylands Drive. The, list, the um, principal part of the listed building is this section here. It's been extended in the 1920s and later in um, post war. You can see some photographs of it, but uh, it's the building. So, this is the existing site. It talks about the substantial part of the listed building, the colonnade in front, and the bay windows on the south side. The extensions of the three story tower, some two story extensions that step down. There are trees on the site, and the tree officer considered <coughs> these three worthy of preservation. On this side, on the, on the west side, you've got two story dwellings gardens uh, backing on to the site and wrapped around the east and south you have Honeyland's Children's Assessment Centre and Branch House School. The assessment Centre building is this one, we'll talk about the hydrotherapy pool, also against the boundary, and the main school building at the south. <coughs> In terms of the open spaces on that site there's a car parking area between the assessment centre and Meadow Road. There is a, a sort of a, you know, playground, if you like, of an outdoor usable space between the assessment centre and the hydrotherapy pool, which is intensively used. There's an area of uh, transition movement space and garden space, and there's <coughs> a uh, landscaped garden it's on the southern boundary of the site. Aero shop. This gives you an idea of uh, the site, how closely the buildings are related, and how they're the, being. The open areas are around various buildings related to the gardens, branch house school. We talked about the space in the centre of the school, the musical space, and the car parking areas. It also gives you an idea of the, the relative size of trees on the site. This one's offside. These are the this is the tree we're talking about about um, would need to be lost to create the access safely onto Pino Road. This is the retain tree. This is the tree as well. The site is. Um, heavily constrained through its, through its listing, through the, the trees on the site, through the relationship with its neighbours. We'll see also around the, around the site there are other trees. This tree is on Branch House School site in the cedar tree, which we're referred to later on, but there are a number of other trees in the area. These trees uh, make a contribution as you move through Pino Road, but also from the Valley Park beyond, when you look up towards there, you see buildings in that skin. This is Pono Road looking up the hill, so it pulls over the station behind us, and we can see the building on site at the moment there. You can see the existing site frontage of the wall, the hedge behind the post to make a new entrance between the tree and the bus shelter. And looking back the other way, you can see the same bus shelter, the same tree, and then a new access will be an application. You can see the three-story tower and the name that sort of um, parts of the listed building in the background. This high wall is enclosing the car park at Branch House. Let's look at the Branch House car park. You can see the elements of the building at the rear which have all been removed, the chimney, the tower, the two-story elements and the lower bits of the building to the left. So uh, this is the assessment centre that we've north the building at Branch House School site, the Valley Wood site. This is looking at the, the space between them. So this is the existing building, this is the this is about three story element and this is the, the two story element which steps down uh, with windows facing the site, this is the former uh, hospital and you can see that the fencing separates the, on the inside the uh, assessment centre is approximately about location, this is the outdoor sort of play area we talked about and the um, hydrotherapy floor is sort of to the right of the G in the camera. That's the Bay Area space, the centre of the site, the centre of the Newlands uh, branch house site. You can see these the listing building, the tower, and the previous shop was down the side. You can see the, the lower parts of the Newlands branch, which is uh, most of the demolished. 
looking the other way down with the um, Bright Child School hydrotherapy or application. So this is the as the site goes down, you can see from outside Bright Child School, you know, as you can see the existing building. See the relationship between the hydrotherapy core building, which is, has its entrance in this location, and the existing building. So, moving around to the garden areas in, um, between Lamacrop Drive and the building, you can see the side with the bay windows, the list of building, the colonnade on that side, and these are the more modern extensions, both to be removed. This is looking up from Frostchamp School, glazed areas used and shaded outdoor space and the gardens which are used. The cedar tree is within the um, Bradshaw school site and you see the fence and the buildings beyond. And just panning around to get the housing on Lamacrum Drive, the gardens join the site. See the main building which is supposed to be retained. You also see in foreground here is a, a bomb shelter which is proposed to be relocated off site and a potential uh, willing taker for a, a museum to take that section of the bomb shelter. <coughs> so the entrance of the bomb shelter on the list of building. Um, round to the Pinnat Road looking at the Pinnat Road site and seeing three storey tower on the left. Just a couple of um, shots inside, inside to show you what is happening. The building has been um, has been vandalised and been uh, got into. It's been uh, vacant for a number of years while well, the NHS looked to dispose of it. And you also see that uh, whilst it has been vandalised and been in institutional use, there are a number of features within the building skirting boards, doors, architraves, uh, roof line that is now unfortunately been smashed and water getting in. But uh, there are a number of features which are um, still with the building, which is proposed to retain as it falls into a new use. So this is a demolition plan, showing the core bottom elements of the building that have been removed, the main building green has been retained, other elements of hard landscaping, bomb shelter, being removed. This also shows a number of smaller trees around the site that are being removed. This is the large cedar tree we talked about, there are two large trees in this location, in this location. <coughs> and then this is the common view on the frontage of the post to remove the access. So the layout, proposed buildings, um, new access from Pillow Road, loop road within the site, 28 parking spaces, a range round. The core of it is the list of building, the new entrance with a single storey link to it to retain prominence and give prominence to that building. This is a two storey element between existing building and Pillow Road. And this is a two storey element, but it is sunk to a lower level. South of the main building. So, a layout plan showing means of enclosure within the site. One of the questions you're one of the responses from the police concerned that the public would be able to wander in and just access all parts of the site. That isn't the case. It's shown boundaries to delineate between private space and public space from the entrance to approach the entrance, and also to re reduce access behind the building. Doing just a circulation space. It also restricts access of the ground floor rooms, which have a, a window, so they have a private space immediately in front of that. Um, and this is a sort of garden area between uh, the building and the branch house, but it is not used as a general garden because they're looking at the circulation space. The building has been amended in a number of ways uh, since it was first submitted. One was to cut back the two story element here to give great, great prominence. To the list of building and another key way is by moving this wing of the building further away from the boundary. There's now a 12 meter minimum separation distance between the building and the boundary. This is the post new access. This is the tree coming on the frontage. This access can't be moved any further to the right because you'd have visibility issues and visibility would become unsafe. Bus shelter in this location, but also the curtain wall. 
into the relocated substation and the new substation will be installed adjacent to the entrance. So moving through the uh, floor plans of the building, this is the lower floor, so on the uh, southern part of the site only. Um, and in this you'll see the, the only window in this location is a um, assisted uh, a, a bathroom. So that window will be obscured glazed and marked in subsequent plans. We've got the um, sort of lounge areas and communal spaces arranged into the site and giving access onto the gardens inside the site. So you go on one level, so this is a first floor south of the building, and it's ground floor north of the building. But again, the, 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 the windows on here, the only window that has an assisted uh, bathroom window, which should be obscured closed until you come to this location. You've got windows facing the boundary. So that's where we have the 12 meter separation in the boundary. Again, um, the common spaces are largely arranged in the uh, reception entrance is arranged to spill out and take access from the centre of the site. This section of the site, there's some space between them, there's a patio area, but this on the other part of the um, I mean, that's, um, assessment centre site, there's the car park here. Yeah. This is up to the next level, so you can see the uh, space within the retained building, the reuse of that building, and the upper floor of the block facing the road. Okay. Elevations, this is top one is from within the site, so you see how the retained element has been given prominence by setting this block down and cutting back the two-story element. This is the uh, elevation uh, towards the assessment centre of Brightshell School. So where we do have windows, they are looking towards the car park element of uh, that site. And here we have the windows of the assisted bathroom, which is the is that elevation, that part of the elevation. The kitchens and um, so on from those schools sit forward. It's very hard for you to see that that is the the roof line is dotted there of the assessment centre. So the, these do sit forward and stand adjacent to the car park on the top of the um, branch house honeymoon side, assessment centre side. This part is set back from the boundary. Um, this is looking up from, we saw that view from the branch house and school garden. These windows that are facing down the side, parallel to the boundary in a similar location to the existing building elevation. Um, this bit is a stairwell. So this is the end of that block. This is the elevation below road as the access into the site but also that retains the wall and hedge in front of the building. So this is the plain elevation taking taking that away to see the building. And this has been amended to include more brickwork and, and give some more visual interest and some better quality up to Pillow Road frontage. Some detailed elevations. So this is a composite. You can see the hydrotherapy pool and the uh, assessment centre building, courtyard space in between the car parks and the park. You can see how the proposed buildings and the removed buildings in red relate to the school next door. So this would have been extended to the previous building. From this point here, the proposed building steps back from the boundary. Let's see if that steps back. It's a three week demonstrative So we have 64 units of um, care home use. You'll see on the update sheet that the, uh, the NHS have requested uh, GP surgeries contributions from the site. We normally do secure those. We've seen in the previous scheme from residential development, we don't normally secure that from care homes where care is provided and people moving in locally will either keep their GP or people moving in um, would have uh, a GP service provided through the care home as well. So for that reason, we don't agree that this application was, should be securing um, GP surgery contributions. Um, we feel this the scheme has been through a number of Iterations. It's been a, a long time the building's been empty. We do feel we have a scheme now that can uh, safeguard the resentment listed part of the school and part of the building, the former hospital, uh, give that a, a good setting uh, and safeguard uh, the core of the building, the, um, the 
renovated and been brought back into use. The other, issue, the other issue, key issue is the access in Pinot Road, um, where the tree officer has confirmed that, provided there is a planting scheme, he finds the, the loss of the uh, common yew tree acceptable, given that it is necessary to uh, provide a safe vehicle access onto the highway. Uh, the highway property and the firm may consider that access safe and cannot be moved further to the right to save the tree, unfortunately. We've got Councillor Halliford and then Councillor Bialik with questions so far. Thank you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just won't bother with that, I think, and just speak up. Um, it's really in re some questions in regard to the representations and the financial contributions that are alluded to in the report. And, and if I may share, just to give some context to my questions, on page 130, healthcare impact, quote unquote, the NHS has sought contributions towards GP surgery provision. However, the care home operators have their own private GP contracts so would have no impact upon local capacity. Acute service contributions are not considered robustly justified. Then on page 134, we have the NHS Devon Clinical Commissioning Group. And again, this quote, and you will know this better than anybody because you're one of the local members, the CCG's concerns is that the combined surgeries of Whipton surgery and Southern A House surgery, the branch surgery, are already over capacity within their existing footprint. Therefore, it allows to have a sustainable development in human health terms. The whole local health care provision will require review. And then goes on to say the surgeries already have 7,542 patients registered between them, uh, etc. etc. Then on the same page, Royal Devon University Healthcare. NHS Foundation Trust. Again, it quotes the fact that um, it's currently operating at full capacity in the provision of acute and planned healthcare. And this is further demonstrated that this development will create potentially long term impact on the trust's ability to provide services as required. And then finally, Chair, on page 147, um, under healthcare impacts, um, Royal Devon University's Healthcare Foundation requested a contribution of 34,000. 547 from the development towards the cost of providing provision of acute and planned health care with increased population resulting from the development. In the absence of such a contribution, the Trust objects to the application. It is however considered that, among other matters, insufficient information has been provided on how this arises as new demand. So, and, and, and the bit that's a bit concerning, Chair, is uh, what this contribution will be spent on and whether it meets the test for planning obligations specified in SEAL Regulation 122 and National Policy Planning Framework, is that the right, got my acronym right, yeah. Section 57. So, so it's really, Chair, my question is is to get to get a feel of this because I know that there's a private provision but also there's huge oversubscription in the area and, and, I, and, and also not just the, in terms of the GP provision but also pharmacies and general access to healthcare and how this sits in the bigger picture of, you know in, in this area because it, it will it will cause um, you know more healthcare interactions quite clearly people terminal illnesses at the end end of their uh, life journey hospice care etc etc within within this building which will require healthcare interventions and um, from, from from the health service across the board and it's really so we don't set up this to fail um, our, the question is, are we assured as members through the offices that all these various themes about healthcare provision and, and, and GP capacity have been adequately addressed or do we approve it and then end up putting more demand into this system that's going to um, bung up an, an already much over uh, subscribed uh, system? Thank you, Chair. Good. Thank you. So. First of all, it is worth noting, you know, what is proposed as a care home, which will add to the care home, to the care provision in the city. Second is that we've got two different NHS contribution requests. One is for GP surgeries, and we've touched on why we don't think that is appropriate to a care home. Second is the Royal Devon uh, University Healthcare Foundation Trust, which we're kind of all getting used to saying. Um, we don't feel in their case that they have evidence the, the need and that it meets the tests and how it will be spent and we are working with them on that. So so that is an ongoing dialogue but at the moment we don't think the evidence is there. 
to say that it meets the, the planning tests. But is it going to be a question? It is a question. So, so Chair, I, I, I'm still seeking assurance that we're, we're looking to approve a, a planning application today where the conversations are still ongoing and the evidence has not been provided by one way or the other. So we could well be making a decision, Chair, that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not evidence and, and you know, ongoing ramifications. I think, if I'm going to paraphrase from Howard a little bit, first of all, uh, my experience of care homes is people move into the care homes and then they go to the local doctor. What Howard is saying is there is not going to be moved to the local doctor, they're going to bring a doctor in from wherever and they're going to pay for that privately. So that what, that the immediate impact won't be on the local doctors who are oversubscribed because as we all know, or we should know, there is no doctor surgery in Beacon Heat, so the whole of that area there's no doctor and that's why Whipton and Mac Pleasant suffer quite so badly and they know as a result. Um, I think the other item is that at this point and this application, the Royal Devon blah 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 blah, blah trust uh, cannot we cannot consider it because they've not provided the evidence for this application. But because we want them to be able to claim, we are working with them to make something test legally. But as far as this application goes, this it they do not have a strong enough case. Therefore, we cannot put it reasonably. As you know, the planning system has to be reasonable. It cannot reasonably be put with this application. Does, I don't think that satisfies you, but do you understand vaguely where we are? Uh, I, I Quickly. Do, I do, Chair, but one question I do have to you is most of these care homes do have local authority contracts where they take subsidised um, provision from people that can't afford the full tariff. Um, is, is, is the developer or the operator of this still going to say that those, those people who are, are on subsidised rates will have access to this private GP provision? Or, 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 or I'm mean, sorry, it's a technical question, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking about if we've got 10, 20, 30 percent in there going in who are subsidised, will they get the private provision, or then will they be then coming back into our system? First of all, I think we're going beyond the planning realms, and this is more what you wear your county hat for. So I think we're getting a little confused which local authority we're in. But secondly, if they even if they're subsidised, it needs to be topped up or the full the full subsidy essentially what they're asked for is paid. So they must take that into account when they're bidding for the people. <coughs> Councillor by Alec, question. Well, yeah, it is a question and it's for Brian again, and I'm not asking you to meet me anywhere and cycle anywhere. It's about access. Can we just take a look at that a minute? Now I know there was issues about the other one some years ago, and I can understand that. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. well, actually, the picture, the photograph of that. No, oh, stop, stop. So it's going to just put your what's his name wherever that axis is going to come out. Okay, okay. Now I've got to say it. I used to live there, hair in behind there, and being an old bus driver and that's on the brow of the hill look at the map you've got it's quite a busy you've got Reckon's Close you've got the other four it's quite a busy part of town so Brian assure me please that this is totally safe you've done all the things and everything's going to be fine with that access going there you've done all your studies and everything is perfectly safe brow the hill on a bend speed in traffic because they don't i know it's speed in traffic you're going to be sure that is perfectly safe thank you i can obviously never guarantee that any access is perfectly safe because people have accidents at all sorts of strange locations but the access meets all contemporary standards and um, I've not been directly involved in this one up until now, but um, there has unusually been a stage one safety audit uh, done on this, this access and um, uh, there were a couple of minor issues uh, raised but the designer's response has satisfied us on that so we are content with, with the access as proposed. There's, there's nothing in it that we could um, you know, recommend refusal. Just, just very quickly, would you agree, Brian, that 20 is plenty of speed bumps? Well, they need to be changed, is what I'm saying. There are, um, this is something I've got involved in on a couple of things recently, Chair, where um, 
the county has got policies on uh, reducing speed limits. Um, I think it's very unlikely that we'd be able to do that here. But um, yeah, lower speeds resulting generally, not, not always less accidents, but certainly lower rates of severity in accidents. Sorry, Councillor Mitchell, I'm going to butt in as local member. Why can't you make that road a 20 mile an hour zone? I think we probably need a separate discussion on uh, on, on speed policy, Chair. And, um, okay. you know, it's it's not my complete area of expertise, but to some extent, if you um, when you're looking at speed limits, there has to be a degree of self enforcement. Otherwise, you're extremely unlikely to get police support for a change of speed limit. Thank you for indulging me, Councillor Mitchell. Okay. Your privilege, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, could I just home in on the comments of Historic England? Because uh, I'm somewhat concerned from the earlier pictures we're seeing or the plans we were seeing. It reminded me of a Christmas pudding about 50 years ago where on Christmas Eve I had to put the silver threepence, the silver sixpence into the middle of the Christmas pudding. It almost seems like the building that's supposed to be the listed building was lost in this mass of Christmas pudding around it uh, that didn't seem to fit in at all. And I'm uh, just wondering, in light of the comments uh, by Historic England here, asking the council will need to consider any harm within the wider planning balance to ensure the greater weight is given to the assets conservation. And it does seem to me that the development is currently planned is overpowering in relation to the existing building. Uh, both by the scale of the development around it and by the nature and designs of those buildings. And I just wonder what consideration has been given at the design stage uh, to make sure this sort of Lego design that surrounds this very nice classical uh, Georgian building enhances it rather than detracts from it. I mean, first thing to say, I mean, this is a, a reuse of the listed building that will preserve it and, and, and restore it. Secondly, is that it has been designed to step down and give prominence to you know the most attractive part of you know facades of what it retained. And we think we've done you know they've done a good job of that. There is a quantum of development you need to make a care home work. So along with all the other constraints on the site, it's been a very challenging site. We've been talking to, to various people over a number of years. We do feel we've got to a got to a scheme that does balance that and does bring the building back into use whilst they're giving prominence to the listed building and protecting it for the longer term. So you're happy with the design features built into the block of this sort of square Lego design with uh, windows that don't match the window design of the existing building? I think there is a clear distinction between the new and the old. You've got a, you know, glazed elements to separate the heavier brick elements. I think brick and render is, is what you see in the residential development. <coughs> immediately around that area so it does it does make that um, to make that junction with the residential use and the, the historic building I mean when that listed building was first built it was a villa set in extensive grounds Pino Road wasn't what we see today so Pino Road was enlarged into the grounds of the building you've then had residential de development over decades that have eaten away at the landscape setting it is now you know uh, it's a it's a very attractive element that's left but it is only one element um, and I think we've yeah got a, got a proposal here that balances the, the desire of retaining what was the old villa uh, and bring it into a new use I don't think these drawings do the best justice to the materials you know this is a this is a brick two-story brick building um, which is substantially shorter than the stone um, eye-catching listed element in the middle I think the, 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 the residential parts of the care home will sit in with the surrounding development as well and give problems to the, to the building in the, in the middle. Councillor Moore. Thank you. Um, uh, it would be very helpful if you could tell us what colour the materials are because they were different from that from the other drawing. Um, my, so my question, so that's my bonus question, this is a bit deja vu you're going to hear here. Um, I just wanted to know, clarify the um, condition on page 150 that um, uh, cut and fill for the management of waste will be on site as um, as a requirement rather than um, taking everything off to landfill. Um, and 
in the report it says that the um, development will be built to a BRIAM standard. Is that the standard that really doesn't say which which level it achieves? Is it excellent as required in the planning document documentation? Or and um, is there provision for the uh, provision for the storage and recharging of motor scooters? Thank you. Um, in terms of the materials, they're actually conditioned to be agreed. So we would expect a full material schedule and you know, get the right materials. So having a drawing which is then rendered electronically on the screen doesn't give a good impression. But we will, we will make sure that we do get a good scheme of materials, which is which is brick and render as opposed to the, the main facades that we need them. In terms of Briam, um, they have done an assessment. Their scoring comes out at 62. So very good is 55, excellent is 70. There are some issues around here about how you how you reuse a listed building and how that scores in Brigham. Reuse of a building actually gets you very few credits, <coughs> although it's very good in um, avoiding loss of body of carbon, you don't score very well. We haven't put a score in here because we do want to work with the applicant. We've got a score of 62 as a provisional design score. We've got a conservation officer in Owen Cambridge who is very interested in sustainability for listed buildings and his historic assets. So we want to work with them to see if we can improve on that score of 62. We wouldn't get, um, go down from very um, excellent, which is our policy standard, just down to very good. We want to maximise the score we think we can achieve whilst protecting the listed building. Uh, and in terms of waste, there is a condition on you say to uh, secure a waste audit statement. There isn't a great deal of cut and fill on this site. It is reusing footprint where buildings were before, so I would hope that there could be um, very little material if any taken off site. The applicant may be able to um, help us with that. And in terms of the waste hierarchy, is that about reprocessing, reusing any um, waste that can be reused on site rather than take it off? Um, there is provision for visitors' motor scooters in reception area. I'm not aware that the, what the, um, the charging apparatus that you would need for a car, it's uh, very onerous for motor scooters, I understand it can just use the normal electrics of the building. We can put it on the condition if the applicant is real with that, you know, we'll like to hear what they're planning anyway, but it would be suitable, suitable matter for a condition. Thank you. I think, again, using my extensive experience of uh, care homes that recently come to light, uh, the general, it's, it goes back to the kind of the stopping people from wandering too much onto the site. People are being encouraged not to wander off the site generally, and I imagine there isn't that much use of electricity mobility scooters once people are in the care home. Councillor Jobson, do you want to put your hand up just at the last minute, or we, can we move on? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll give you more notice. <laughs> right, I'm only yeah. Okay, in that case, I've got two speak speakers, an objector and a supporter, and in my wisdom have decided, as I have the ability to do so, to allow them both to speak for five minutes, because there are two applications, it's the listed building and the actual planning application. So first of all, I'd like to call the objector, who I think is Rebecca Wheeler, yeah? Thank you very much. Press one of the buttons. You get the five minutes. Yeah. Any button, yeah. Either of those much, yeah. Yeah. As long as it's on the front, you'll get five minutes and we'll give you a heads up when you're in there. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here as a representative of Ranch House, who is the main neighbour of this site. We're a children's charity who work with Devon County Council and the NHS to provide a school for children with significant physical disabilities and a large paediatric outpatient medical department serving 2,500 children through Devon. We feel the proposed development will be detrimental to the children we serve and the service we offer, so we feel duty-bound to contest the proposal. Our charity used to be part of the Honeylands Children's Hospital, which is the site this application relates to, and we worked closely together until the NHS ceased to use the building several years ago. The land and the building were donated to the City of Exeter by Miss Violet Wills in the 1920s, explicitly for use as a children's medical facility. The building was originally a children's sanatorium, and then our founders were asked to work with the RDE to develop it into a centre for handicapped children. The building was used for the purpose for which it was gifted to the city until the centre closed in 2012 as a result of the building requiring substantial repairs. We have several serious concerns about the development. First of all, it's a significant deviation from the original conditions of the gift of the building, which was to benefit the children of Exeter. The demands on children, Exeter's children's services are expanding dramatically as the population grows, 
and also younger and younger premature babies are surviving who often have significant ongoing medical needs. So it is difficult to understand why use commensurate with the original covenant cannot be found. The position of the proposed new access and the number of staff and patients who will be using it daily raises road safety concerns. Both of our sites are accessed off the busy main Pinho Road and the proposed development will have limited parking for the large number of staff and patients. Reduced parking on the new site to discourage car use is commendable, but in our experience, the majority of staff in health and social care roles live outside of Exeter and have no option but to commute by car. Our school children regularly go out into the community in their wheelchairs, and we have concerns about the safety around the entrance to our site, and also for the access for emergency ambulances, which we have several times a week. The mobility needs of our patients mean it is not possible for many of them to use public transport, so they park on our site and the surrounding roads, and an increase in cars parked on the roads caused by staff and visitors to the developed site will mean that our disabled patients are likely to have to park further away. Many of our patients travel with a lot of medical equipment so have significant logistical difficulties. We have a statutory duty to safeguard our pupils' rights to dignity and privacy while at school. We have particular concerns about patient confidentiality during what is often a very difficult time in their lives. Because our site was originally designed to work with the facility operating in the old building, many of our rooms face that building and have large windows or glass walls. Our children have medical appointments whilst with us and the parents can become quite distressed. The current design for the development next door includes windows, patios and garden space next to our boundary looking into our rooms. We have a small site and we cannot rearrange our layout to accommodate for this. Our parents feel that the intended use of the development, which is end-of-life care, is unfortunately extremely insensitive next door to a school and centre that serves many children with life-limiting illnesses, some of whom sadly die during their time with us. This is an extremely upsetting thing for our parents to confront. An increasing number of our children have autism and have become very distressed by loud or sudden noises, which will be a problem having construction and an operating health centre feet from our classrooms. We understand the need for adult care facilities and for the building to be restored, but we do not believe that the proposed use is in line with the reason the building was gifted to Exeter, or that the proposed structure and enlargement will be a benefit to the attractive original historical building. We feel very strongly that the proposal will have a detrimental impact on the medical and educational services we provide for the children of Exeter and of the larger county. We are disappointed that the Planning Committee report states that the developments have no unacceptable impact on our services and our patients, as we feel the opposite is true. Some of the information about us and our site provided in the application and the report are inaccurate. Okay. Ooh, you've got another minute. I'm just waiting. Sorry, I've been so fast. That's all right. I was a bit worried. We're all, now we're all prone to racing ahead. We're a bit nervous, don't we? Um, would you be happy to answer yes, questions? Okay, Councillor Hannaford? Thank you, Chair. Um, could you just um, thank you for your presentation and, and the points that you've raised. Um, two questions. Um, in terms of the, the covenant uh, and, the, and the gift of the site, presumably that's got lost somewhere in the monolith of the NHS. And, and did you have discussions when the sites were changing over that as a facility you needed extra capacity and, and it, perhaps it, you could have almost expanded your site um, and I would be interested to know, um, again, you know, in your view, are your clients and families adequately looked after at the moment with, with what we have in and around Exeter? Um, but the, so, so, so that's the, that's the first sort of sort, sort of area, um, Chair. And also, could could you just please expand um, um, in terms of the you alluded to it at the end of your presentation, further inaccuracies yeah. and inconsistencies in the in the in the report, please. Um, because I think that would be important. So, so what's a potted history? What's okay. what's what's what what is service provision looking like at the moment? You know, yep. thing, and then and then what are your further concerns? And can I ask that you do that as concisely as possible, yes. given the length of time I'm allowing it okay. to speed? So, when we um, got ownership of our part of the site, uh, the covenant was left applying to both sites that it should be primarily for the use of children and it can only be uh, overlooked if you cannot fulfill that purpose. Um, so we, in terms of how we're operating, I'm trying to remember everything said, sorry. In terms of how we're operating at the moment, um, we are bursting at the seams. We spent two years while the site was for sale trying to engage with the rd &E and the estate agents to potentially purchase it for ourselves because Devon County Council are pushing us to massively increase our school provision 
and the NHS CCG are in pushing us to increase outpatients. Um, Cranbrook's had a huge impact on us. The pandemic has had a massive impact. We stayed open, so we didn't increase our waiting list because of that, but it's just uh, caused huge problems. So in terms of us and where we're going, uh, the need is expanding hugely. Um, the number of premature babies who are very disabled has gone up exponentially in the last 10 years, and we hold medical clinics on site for the rd &E, and the paediatricians say that's not going to stop. Um, the more young, very young babies we keep alive, um, of course, the more ongoing medical care they require. And I'm sorry, what was the third issue? Um, uh, so, what, sorry, through you, Chair, um, what you, you're, you alluded to at the end of your presentation, oh, yes, the further inaccuracies. inaccuracies, yes. Um, so, the description of certain buildings uh, on our site and what they're for, one of the biggest concerns is the small astroturfed courtyard that was shown in one of the photographs with um, uh, like an awning permanent structure at one end. Um, that is right next to the site. There's about a six foot gap between us and the other building, maybe slightly more. Um, that is the only contained outdoor space we have on site and the only place we can have one. It's specifically for our extremely autistic, non-verbal children um, who are primary school age because they need a very contained, secure site. Um, and we feel that that inaccuracy is important because it's they're the children will be most disrupted by what's going on next door and the planning proposal means the kitchens will be there. So the noise disruption and it, it, it will sort of impact directly on the fact that that's the space for those children. And it's a growing area of need um, that the council's expressing. Thank you. Um, um, Councillor Hanford um, asked one of the questions. Um, uh, uh, it's really interesting to hear your um, your views on this, but uh, am I to understand that the site has been sold and was it owned by the county council or the RD? The most recent owner is the RD&E. Is the RD&E, yeah. um, but, but you've been unable to negotiate. The estate agents it. told us they were only interested in speaking to a developer and the rd &E didn't respond to phone calls with messages, written posts or emails for two years. We contacted the Estates Department. When they, when they eventually got hold of us, they said it's sold. And um, when we asked you many years ago, you weren't interested. Uh, that would have been under a previous chief executive and it would have been some time ago. And at the time, it may have been that we didn't have the funds. Mm. Um, but we'd clearly expressed in many ways our interest in the site. For many yeah, reasons, yeah. we need it, but also the control of uh, yeah. and the protection of our children. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful and I appreciate that you know, it's, um, it's a complex matter and you've been dealing with it over, yeah. over a long period of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, well, mm -hmm. one more question, I think. Yes. I think that's breaking. It is. Rebecca, I was fascinating listening to you as a retired head teacher of a a highly inclusive school. Um, many of my ex pupils would have used the um, hydrotherapy pool, ranch house, Honeyman Children's Centre, and the assessment unit. Um, I'm devastated to see it in the state that it's in at the moment. Um, I guess my problem is I know, I know the effects that that sort of development can have on severely autistic children, but you do recognise that the place needs refurbishing and redoing, so it will have that knock on effect. Um, what else could it be? We feel quite strongly that it should be in line with its original covenant, even if it's not used by us. There is a massive increasing need for children's services in Exeter. Um, with regards to it being developed, it definitely needs developing, and whoever does that is going to make some noise and some mess, and then there's going to be the buildings going to be used. But the proposed extensions are incredibly close to our site, which we feel isn't quite as necessary. They've been moved backwards and forwards a few times by the developer, um, but it's the, the huge size of it is a particular concern. And because it's what it's being used for, it's not residential homes, so there's noise 24 hours a day. It's a slightly different situation. Thank you. I, I asked because I, I, I was in mind that actually young children and old people can be good bedfellows. Yes. Right? They get on very well. And I think there could be a worst case scenario than that. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that about this talk about the covenant. And I, I, I We're covenant. taking legal advice on it at the moment. Thank you. Anyway, thank you, Jane. Yeah. Um, just because I like to be a bit of a planning board, covenants don't, we don't have to consider the covenant, we have to consider the application before us. 
have a ball like that. Councillor Asfarshin. Sorry, why question of doing that? Right, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether now's a good time to talk to the solicitor about covenants or after we've listened to the objector. I think you've covered the point. Okay, apparently I've covered the point. Okay. Okay, in which case uh, we have a support speaking, which is Andy Marshall. Again, you get five minutes, and there are likely to be questions, I imagine. Thank you very much, Chair, Councillors. Bracket Investments are experienced specialist developers of older persons' care accommodation. Our proposal seeks to redevelop the Honeyland site to form a 64-bed C2 use care home which is desperately needed by virtue of the ageing, increasingly ageing local population. The MPPF states the lack of suitable accommodation to meet the needs of older people is critical. And across Exeter there's a need for 550 additional care beds, wet room, uh, future proof care beds, as much of the existing stock is ageing increasingly no longer fit for purpose. This site, already being in Class C2 use, is perfectly suited to help meet those needs in a sustainable and accessible location. Having now acquired the site, we're in a position of subject of planning, of course, to deliver the facility as soon as possible, freeing up approximately 35 uh, family homes and creating construction and long term employment jobs, about 60 whole time equivalent jobs. The proposal also promises to restore the derelict and deteriorating Grade 2 listed Honeyman's House, the setting for which, as you've heard, has already been lost. Our plans are to conserve the original features remove the unsympathetic um, additions, the tower and the two-storey extensions, and develop the site in a more sensitive manner, achieving a fine balance between the overarching heritage, key trees, and neighbouring immunity concerns. Your hedgehog officer does consider our plan to be beneficial to this building. One important aspect of the proposal is the new access onto Pinhoe Road, removing the previous convoluted access through Lamacroft Drive, and opening up views of the listed building from Pinhoe Road thereby removing potential concerns from local residents, and this has been accepted by the Higher Authority as the best location. Access by public transport is key, as whilst residents will largely not be mobile, the average age of entry to a care home like this is 85, the average length of stay is two years, so it really is end of life care. So the vast majority of staff are expected to travel by bus. <coughs> residents are likely to move from elsewhere within the city and be cared for by round the clock 24 hour personal and nursing care on the premises. Thus, actually reducing the impact on GP services because they're moving from homes that are not well equipped, so it reduces falls, reduces people not taking their medication, etc., they're being properly looked after. Where possible, key trees have been retained and respected, whilst proposed landscaping and ecology proposals will result in a biodiversity net gain for the site. The scheme also delivers on energy efficiency. The proposal follows best practice regarding progressive privacy through a household model, so it enables residents to live within smaller wings of accommodation, so it appears as a domestic scale for them, that they're more familiar with, for their daily needs, yet providing access to wider facilities, so on-site hair salon, cinema, wellness suite, cafe, bar, library, those kind of things. We had a positive reception to our plans at our uh, community consultation day, but we've since worked hard to improve them further to overcome branch house schools concerns. This includes moving the southern wing of the building further away from the eastern boundary. So there is, as you heard, a 12 metre gap from the nearest windows to the boundary, whilst internal layout has also been changed to remove windows overlooking the east. Due to careful design, the southern wing is effectively single storey. Thus the ground floor is actually at the first floor level. Does the combination of site levels, boundary fencing, in addition to the alterations, mean there's less opportunity for overlooking than the existing building, were it to be returned to use itself? Thus, the final plan is a local plan policy compliance, supported by the MPPF, and crucially have the support of all statutory consultees, including Historic England and your planning officer. I sincerely hope, therefore, you'll back this project, enable us to restore this historic asset to its former glory was creating jobs and helping meet this crucial society need. Thank you for your time and attention. Any question, please? Thank you. There's another minute left over. We're going to have to extend it to four minutes. Next time. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, I've got a question from Councillor Hallam. Thank you. I've got three interlinked points. You've just said to the committee 
um, that uh, this your application has the support of all statutory consultees. Well, I, I, I would challenge that, to be honest with you, because I think some of the questions and comments from statutory consultees in here are at least ambiguous, if not necessarily hostile to your application, particularly around healthcare and, and, and healthcare provision. The second interlinked point is um, in relation to your business model and your operations. And Chair, I, I, I touch upon that because it is actually interlinked into the material considerations in the application. Is your operation going to take subsidised local authority placements? Who um, are they going to have um, equal access to your private GP provision? Or is your division, uh, is your um, your um, operation uh, and, and development solely um, focused on people with means enough to be able to afford to go there? And lastly, Chair, um, interlinked again, um, I don't know whether the applicant or, or the support of the applicant is in the late sheet from the planning committee, but if I can quote to you, item seven, planning application, Honeylands Hospital for Children, Pinhole Road, and I'll, I'll, it's, I'll just read it to you quickly, just in case you haven't seen it. A further representation has been received from the NHS Devon CCG, CCG. It has been stated that there will be no impact on local GP services as a care home operator will contract directly with a private GP service. This is not something that we have encountered before and would like to receive written confirmation that at no time will any of the residents register with the local NHS GP practices. Under the handbook to the NHS Constitution for England, updated the 4th of February 2021, patients are free to choose who they register with, see extract, you have the right to choose your GP practice and to be accepted by that practice unless there are reasonable grounds to refuse, in which case you will be informed of those reasons. Without such a commitment, NHS Devon stands by its contribution request and would like to be raised at the committee raised by the committee members in order for it to be included within section 106 should the application be approved can you give this committee a cast iron guarantee that none of your clients will be registering with the gp service so that the already oversubscribed healthcare system will not be further have a further burden placed upon it thank you chair if you could ask it's like for me and um, we're not in a courtroom council hundreds you quite get so incensed about everything well chair yeah. in fairness yeah, to you it's your residents who have yeah, got the old no, gp, GP yeah. practices i know and, and i know it's an issue for us to take i know seriously. my outstanding problem but just a well let's up, not add to it then, a chair. little calmer councillor hannaford thank you thank you um yeah could you point out to me which the statutory quantities are who have objected to this uh, the health service, local healthcare providers, a, they don't seem in, 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 overwhelmingly in favour of this, do they? So, I'm not aware of an objection from the statutory consultee. Well, we last week received something from the CCG. Those requests have a not statutory been... Consultee. They've not been made to any other care home application. And I'm not sure why they're really being made well, to I'd, I'd say that was at least a concern, if not an objection. Mr. Um, sorry, I did catch your name. Marshall. Marshall. Um, yes, whether they're statutory consultee or not, they've asked for a request for contribution towards uh, funds for GP provision, uh, which is, I think, just to confirm before going to the other questions, I'm not aware of any other statutory consultee objection to the application. So it's not unanimous support then? I don't think the CCG are statutory consultee. Just to confirm, the, the, the statutory consultees are on certain applications, people like the Environment Agency, Highway Authority. The CCG have responded to this application and we take their comments and we consider them. They aren't the statutory consultees. Right. Um, I've got a question. Sorry, mm -hmm. are you able to respond to the other questions? All oh, right, you not Ralph. responded, sorry. Yeah. I was getting advice. Yeah, I think it's important that I do. Um, so, we're unable to confirm who the operator will be. It's our experience with operators, they do have the private contract, but because we can't name who they are at this stage, I think it is fair that whilst we don't consider that they have made the case properly, that it has to be section 122, the SIL regs, has to be directly related, necessary, reasonable, fair and reasonable. Um, that for reasons I said, the residents will be cared for around the clock. They'll be moving from probably areas that, within Exeter so they may well be in the same GP surgery. They'll certainly be better cared for. So the actual burden to the NHS 
will reduce. But because we're unable to confirm the cast iron guarantee that you asked for, because we don't know exactly who that operator will be yet, I can't speak on their behalf, so I can't give that guarantee. So we are happy, if you are, to discuss uh, making that contribution that's been requested by the CCG. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask a question and then Councillor Sutton has one. Um, you said that there's going to be a net gain, gain on biodiversity, and looking at the site as it is now versus the site, how you'd like it to be, it's difficult to see having lost the tree and a lot of the green space to car parking, how that works. So can you explain that to me, please? Uh, yes, the um, considerations around the historic building have been such that we have been asked not to develop any more in terms of car parking or tarmac than is necessary. So therefore we have 27 parking spaces. The landscaping for the site is that all trees last to replant at a ratio of more than three to one. So there is, and also it's the type of ground. So a lot of the ground is, hasn't got much ecological benefit at the moment, but because we've replanted whether it's wildflower meadows, whether it's a species of trees, the back box you've heard about earlier, there'll be lots of elements of it, but together it's a better use of the site. As you can see there, it's quite well, it's been derelict for 10 years. Thank you very much. Councillor Sutton? Thank you. Yes, I wanted to um, to go back to um, the issues around um, cycle storage um, space, and I think it was um, uh, Councillor Moore talking about electric buggies. Um, given the, the, the nature of the um, potential residents of this, um, I'm, I'm assuming that the majority of the, the, the cycle use would be for the staff and visitors, although I'm sure there will be residents who, who might cycle. Um, are they going to be able to um, charge electric buggies if they use those, or electric bikes if, if they're able to use those? Because I can't, apologies if it's in there, I can't see any reference to that. It's highly unlikely that residents would be able to use, they wouldn't have the mobility to be able to use it. But because the very purpose, the very point of the nursing staff is to improve the independence of residents, you never know. Because this is why there's a need for these facilities. People are living longer with more and more multiple conditions. But, you know, someone who was older, probably now only older than 70, because we're all learning to be able to do more in later life. So therefore, things have developed. And it might be that residents might be able to use those facilities. So we did respond to a consultee uh, inquiry and said yes, there is electric scooter charging points that we'll be putting within the visitor spaces. In terms of normal cycle parking, for staff and for visitors, as you say, we've got two areas, one for staff near the building, and then because of the heritage concerns, you don't want too many cyclists down near the <coughs> building, so you've got another area of cycle parking over towards the western boundary of the site for visitors. But, so, sorry, but, but the... The charging points are for visiting vehicles and buggies. You, you're not anticipating any people living in the care home or visiting the care home. They would be open to both visitors and residents if they were able to, because they're not going to exclude anybody from using them, but it's unlikely they would be able to use them. Okay. Councillor Moore. Thank you. Might guess what my questions might be. So the first one is, um, what? Will you be able to work? What expectation do you have that you will be able to reach Brianna Excellence? That's about in planning policy. Um, will we be using cut and fill as the disposal of waste on the site unless it needs to be recycled? And um, how would you respond to the objector's comments about overlooking? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think as was mentioned, we've undertaken an initial Brianna score that is 62, so it's halfway between very good and excellent. There are issues with the listed building that mean it's incredibly difficult to actually get to excellent whilst we're doing what we can with, with, with the listed building. So we're doing the very best that we can to actually meet that standard. In terms of um, the site, yeah, as been mentioned, it will be cut and fill with, um, on the site. I know there's a condition for uh, waste, but we don't envisage there'll be any having to be uh, taken off because we'll be able to lose it. If you look at those three lines there, that's the change in levels when the site drops from the north to the south, so there'll be some landscaping there and some bunding, partly to make sure that those bedrooms have a nice lot of space and that there's a, there's a level difference up there. So that's not where a lot of the cut and fill will be lost to. In terms of the concerns from Branch House, we've worked really hard. We've The initial scheme we submitted was different from our first initial scheme, and then we've revised the scheme further during the applications um, process to actually move the building further away from the school. 
if you look at the, I think the picture that Rebecca showed earlier from the playground there, I think it shows the cross to the building, which is quite a good image. Let me get to it. Yeah, that one. If you see where the lower part of the building is now, behind where the, yeah, that's it there. We're no higher than that. So we're not putting another story. And I think that's the fear people might have. So there's another story development going on top. That isn't the case. The building won't be any higher. It might be a little bit higher, but not you know, significantly higher. And there's certainly there are no more windows overlooking that area. So there is no difference in terms of overlooking. If anything, it's actually better than as, as was the case there. That shows the red uh, squares are the existing windows. And then the black squares are the new windows. So the only ones you've got that are there, whether they weren't, is the ones to the left-hand side there, four windows, which are 12 metres set back. So because of the level difference and the boundary fencing, you won't be able to see across the site for a window, 12 metres over a fence and then down into the front house. We have repeatedly asked Ranch House School to articulate exactly what the concerns are because we really want to know exactly what those issues were. We've not really been able to really get a handle on exactly what those issues are. I, I, I don't understand the comment about looking into windows when Ranch House. I can't see how people would be able to look into windows. I really can't see that. And it is, as been discussed, a quiet neighbour. I think it is something that the two uses work well together. Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just clarify one point? Are you an effect, effectively the site developer? Because you talked about an operator. So is it a franchise sort of system that we don't know who the operator is yet, or you've got somebody lined up in regard to that? Um, uh, the supplementary questions in regard to that, similar to the last development you asked, what are you doing to future proof for carbon footprint for 2030 or 2050 within the building and the continuation after the building? Are you building into the thing to ensure it's of a high quality and durability? Thirdly, what medical facilities do you have on site or intend to build into the site? Because if you've got a private GP coming in, presumably what support services have they got besides a room and a table? And if other services are required, is it the intention of the private GP to build into something like, to, to use the facilities of someone like Nuffield, or will it be using uh, the RDNE? Mm. Um, lastly, in regard to the clientele the operator will be seeking from this, is this a nationally advertised site, or will it be very much a regional or an Exeter service site? Okay, um, yeah, so you're right, we are developers rather than operators of facility. We've developed a dozen care home schemes for different, they tend to be charities and not for profit operators. We are in discussions with operators, but because it's commercially confidential at this stage, we can't name them. Um, but they are an experienced operator who know what they're doing. So we have acquired the site that's available on the open market, and the NHS has its own best value obligations. Um, the second point was about uh, future proofing the site. Yeah, carbon footprint. Yeah, uh, we'll have air source heat pumps, we'll have uh, photovoltaics, we'll have electric charging points, um, it'll be electric use rather than gas as much as we can possibly do. Um, your third point, I think, was on what medical facilities are available on site. Um, yeah, there's treatment rooms, nursing facilities, wellness suites, assisted bathrooms. Um, this is nursing and domiciliary or personal care that is taking place within the home. So, um, sit apart with, with hoist and whatever so that people can be washed and clean. And then they all have um, their own wings of accommodation, have their own little kitchens and diners, as well as the general area. So, they've each got their own kind of means of accommodation. Um, if external treatments required, will you be building into the private sector or using the public sector? So that would be, yeah, so I think because I can't name who the operator and what their practice will be, it will be on site in terms of the facilities for everyday needs and whether it's a private contract with a GP or whether it is through the provision they already have through their doctor, I'm not sure yet, but essentially the provision is on site for their daily needs and a lot more than that because it's 24 hour round, round the clock care. Right, so, so in effect they'll be using the National Health Service as a backup. Yeah, but they tend to, the operators we work with tend to have an, um, a contract with the NHS doctors who also do private work. So it's the, it might be the same doctors, it might be the same practices, they then have private contracts as well as NHS work. 
they're probably familiar with that if you've seen the consultant. It, sometimes yeah. it's the same consultant yeah. at different hours of the day. But in regard to wanting further medical attention, it would tend to be the RD&E role in the Nuffield they'll go to. Is it just, yeah. I think we're losing, yeah, I've been yeah, very lenient yeah, yeah, on yeah, things yeah, that aren't And the last point is, where, where, do you, where is the market for the clientele market? Is it purely Exeter-based, Southwest-based, or is it from a national forum you bring people in? Um, technically, they are allowed to come from anywhere. You can't put a restriction on where people can move from and to. But the average tends to be within a five-mile casual area. Where it's a city like this, it would be within the city that we would expect people to come to, come to because essentially it's local people who might want their parents to be able to move into this area to be near them. That's essentially it's the children that pick the care home for the other. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to open this up for debate. Before we begin, can I remind us, we remind you that we are deciding this on planning matters. That would be the highways, that will be the overlooking, that will be biodiversity and some of those issues. It will not relate to the healthcare because you've had advice on why we're not considering the healthcare. I understand your frustrations, but also these people probably living in Exeter would be going to the rd &E anyway if they had a serious fall or all of that poorly. So I just want to make that clear because I think we're getting a little bit lost into that. It doesn't mean it's not a good debate. And I think actually moving forward with local plan is a very good debate, but it's not necessarily relevant to this application, okay? And I'll remind you that covenants are not a planning matter. They are a legal matter, and that's for the franchise, as they said, and for the, the developers. You're welcome to go back to your seat. Sorry, I've got you just press the button when you think that. Um, uh, so I'm opening it for debate. I've got Councillor Sutton and the Councillor Moore. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for your um, timely reminder about the basis on which we, we are legally required to make this decision. Um, it, I understand that there's a level of frustration, um, particularly um, from Branch House School as, as the neighbours, but we have in front of us a valid application uh, and as far as I can see, um, there are no planning grounds on which it would be reasonable to actually turn this down. Um, we've heard from um, the highways, we, you know, we have a colleague from um, highways with us um, who has, has indicated that there are no objections and they are a statutory consultee. Um, I, I understand the concerns about that road because I drive up and down that road and it, and it is busy around, around that junction. Um, but again, if you actually look at the current access to that site, it actually is, is passed a number of residential houses so you might argue that actually stopping up that that route um, makes that safer and at the moment the building is just falling to bits it, it's been subject to um, vandalism it's been empty for a considerable number of years clearly um, there haven't been any other approaches um, until it, it's been sold and we may not like the decision that was made by the owners but it's a bit like the person who buys the house next door as, as councillor bialik remind us um, we might not like who they've sold the house next door to but it's nothing to do with us and, and we can't we can't stop them um, and any development on this site next to um, a school which has pupils with very particular requirements um, is I suspect going to be disruptive whatever happens on that site and, and I can only hope that the developers will um, stay in contact with the school and be sympathetic um, to them um, because anything that happens um, as I say is going to um, be noise and disruption and a change in the routine um, to the, the, the children who use that, that school and to um, the parents and teachers um, who, who work there. Um, but we could be looking at, at an application, um, I don't know, to build um, you know, 50 houses there, which um, might actually result in, in more disruption, more noise. Um, so we have to consider what we have in front of us, which is an application for a much needed um, care home. Um, and while I, I do have sympathy to the comments made, I, I reflecting on the chair's comments about planning grounds um, and I don't think there are reasonable planning grounds on which to um, to reject this so I will be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Um, I've got uh, questions more like clarifications really please. So the developers um, offered um, 
to contribute towards um, the CCG has requested. So if we could formally move that as a condition, I would be uh, pleased if we could do so. It, it needs to be a legal agreement to secure it. It should go, either be done unilaterally or through a section of the Whatever we need to do, that, I would make it sound right. Thank you. And secondly, um, I wasn't particularly clear about the developer's answer in relation to raising the standard of three and described what was already arrived at. And I do appreciate um, the commitment to refurbishment of a heritage building. That's very really important. Um, so I just would like to know the extent that that can be expected to raise it as far as possible from the, the existing um, standard. Um, I welcome the question about the ecological impact as well because you know yew trees do take a very long time to grow so it must be a very old tree so um, thank you. Thank you. Just going to say something, but I've forgotten what it is because Councillor Hannaford put his hand up. So, Councillor Hannaford, and I'll see if I remember what I was saying. Then, Councillor Fell. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I may have that effect on people sometimes. Um, yes, I mean, Councillor Sutton has encapsulated where we are. Unfortunately, um, I, I think we have to say, as a planning committee and as elected members, it, it's a terrible shame that the that the people involved at the county council and the, and the and the elected representatives did not take up the cudgels for branch house at the appropriate time of the health service um, i know with other hats that i wear everything that the lady said from branch house um, is true in terms of provision and and, and 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 pediatric care and everything else that's going on at the moment there's a desperate need in the city and and it's 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 completely unacceptable as well that the nhs has left this site vacant for over a decade it's a scandal and i think you know that that needs to be looked at as well they were land banking because as councillor sutton has already said it could have been housing it could have been a care home or it could help the ideal that solution would have been the expansion for, ch for children's provision what we are presented with is, is the care home i cannot deny that we need care homes in in the city as has been alluded to that it, it, it's almost a judgment of solomon between the you know the van, you know the children and the older people and i agree with councillor foal you know if you if you take a young person or baby into a care home they you know dementia often falls away doesn't it and people come come alive and maybe in the future there can be a good relationship between the the care home and the school somehow you know that there can be some some way forward that that, that we can work forward nevertheless it is what is in, in front of us today. I, I sadly don't think that the concerns about the interaction between the sites are strong enough. I'm pleased that now, after a, a robust debate, and uh, that the that the uh, developers are amenable to that healthcare provision, because I think that will go some way to a, you know, address local concerns. Um, but nevertheless, I think we will have to go sadly not sadly necessarily in terms of the, the actual provision of the care home because that's needed, but the fact that the children's needs have got lost in translation, which is which is a tragedy. Um, and I hope we can all learn from that. But because of that, I will have to uh, go along with, with the recommendation to approve. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, my mind goes back three years ago when um, this committee uh, gave permission for a, a secure unit to be built next door to one of our primary schools and indeed nursery schools to have a chain wire fence um, separating four-year-olds and people who were in a secure unit and remember Councillor Holland and I both raised many objections to that but we, we ended up passing that so I came to this meeting inclined to, to support the application and so I thought well you know it's hardly a secure unit it's, it's, it's an old people's home um, but the, the power of, of, of the, having a debate and being able to discuss things um, has brought me fully around in the circle. I, I can put forward my proposal that we defer this decision until the legality of the covenant is established, or indeed that the uh, potential impact on the NHS is established, because, as you say, they were not allowed to. Um, so I can't object to it, but I certainly can't support this application. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Uh, Councillor Mitchell. <coughs> um, thank you, Jim. I think all of us were 
mightily impressed with Vance House's statement to us. And they're caught in a dilemma, but it's not a dilemma, sadly, of our making or related directly to this planning application the way that we would, we can consider it as rather than what we would like or how we would like possibly uh, to consider it. Uh, and clearly, as already to say, there is a need for this. That is a derelict site. It is the re-enhancement of a listed building. Um, some of us might have some comments about the additional new buildings that are being put there, the design features, but we wait and see what our officers come up with at the end of the day. Um, so therefore, from that point of view, I feel I have to support this, and particularly in view compared to the previous uh, applicant for housing, they at least appear to be concerned about carbon footprint and thinking ahead in, in regard uh, to that uh, feature. Um, this is, you know, I just hope that there is a neighbouriness between the developer and Branch House mm -hmm. that many of the immediate problems in regard to the development of the site uh, can at least lead to a decent working relationship so matters will result instantly rather than weeks or months later. Um, so as I say, it is not with sadness, but it's with regret that I feel what the position of Ranch House is in. But that's a position I think they have to take up with Devon County Council and with the Health Service because I think they've been mightily let down by both sides. Yeah. I think uh, I'm just going to indulge myself because I'm the local member and I get to do that. Um, I think this application is a tightly balanced application actually because there are many benefits. I think people deserve dignity in old age and in death that this site will provide. Um, it's definitely a need. I also feel that the, the branch house have been let down in the early parts of this process. I don't know that that so much is true in the planning stage of it, but that is obviously fed through to them now and I, I understand their concerns. I think long term the site is probably better used this way than it would have been for more housing. Um, I do have concerns about the access and I will weep a little when they cut down the tree because my entire life that tree has been growing slowly and uh, bringing a little nice bit of green to Pinho Road, which you don't see a lot of along there, I have to say. Um, but I also think for the residents of Honeylands, the access not going through their estate is probably a benefit, not only for road safety, but for emissions. <laughs> and we have to accept that it's probably a low level transport site versus something that, you know, where there's a constant, you know, a shop or something like that, uh, a supermarket. Yeah. So I'm going to vote for this application, but it doesn't mean that any of the things in our robust debate earlier are not relevant and that do not need to be brought forward. And it doesn't mean that I have discarded what Branch has have said to us. I just know that it's a committee we are bound by planning regulations and that means sometimes we make decisions that we may not like uh, but in this case I think probably this is a beneficial use for the site and it will it will make that building which has for so long been falling into disrepair bring it back into use and the advice from Heritage is that you don't try to replicate the buildings around it and I think we can definitely say they're not doing that let's just hope the render is up to all of our uh, ideals and we'll leave that one with Paul Howard Smith to make sure it's okay. Um, I'd like to put this to the vote so would anybody like to move the recommendation and second it got mover now I want a seconder I'll go on one of you thank you councillor Bialik and um, can I ask for all those in favour please seven in favour all those against two again and an abstention from councillor Jobson councillor Jobson abstained <laughs> Roger leading, power to strain there. Okay, Sorry. the final item on our agenda today is application 220361 full. It's a very small application that would not characteristically be before us, but it is a member of staff's application and Roger is going to lead on this for us. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, this is uh, only before us because the uh, yes, is a member of staff of the City Council. Uh, it's a single story rear extension to a terrace house. Uh, it complies with our design guidance. Uh, no neighbours have objected. Uh, there's no reason to justify refusal. Um, I can take you through the, the details of the scheme, suppose, as if you wish. Um, but as I say, it's very straightforward. Can I ask a question? Ah. It, the question would be in any other circumstance, would this application be before a full planning application if it were not belonging to a member of staff? No, our scheme of delegation would allow it to be determined by officers without referral to council at all. In which case, can I suggest we move this to the vote, if unless anyone's got any objections? Yeah. 
There we go. All those in favour? Thank you very much. You. And that brings us to which one am I going first? The list of decisions made and withdrawn. Roger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've not been notified of any members' questions on this. Thank you very much. And finally, item well, not finally, but item ten, the appeals report. Uh, anything to bring to us there, Roger? No, uh, on, on this occasion, I think there's three reports uh, there. Two of them were uh, allowed, I'm afraid, and one of them was dismissed. And are the questions relating to this, Just, just, just a question on, on this. It's, not, it's in regard to the one and two print screen, which was an HMO which was increasing the size by one. Uh, we rejected it. The inspector has overruled our objection because um, our argument was on community balance. All I was asking Roger in relation to that, in that this is a street of numerous two up, two down houses and a small number of HMOs attached to it. Does this set a precedent for other houses in the street automatically getting enlargement of their HMO status uh, without us being able to do anything about it? This is a worry that it, it isn't the effect of one person in one house, it's the effect of 50 people in 50 houses, additionality it is the issue that worries me. How, does this inspector therefore set a precedent uh, for other inspectors it, or stopping us uh, uh, making future rejections? I think if, uh, every case is taken on its own merits and we need to make an assessment every application we get like this whether we think that there is a material impact on the character of the, the area um, and the dwelling as a consequence. It does seem to be a trend that, we, that, that uh, inspectors are allowing uh, a, an addition of one, one single additional person, which as you say, um, we would uh, cumulatively have a potentially greater impact on the character of the area. Uh, and when we, when, we, when we have concerns about them, we will continue to, to argue that we, don't, that we think there is harm being caused. Uh, but as I say, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So to answer your question, I don't think there is a, uh, a strict precedent here because we win some and we lose some. But what's confusing is that we're, it's not entirely clear which ones we're winning and which ones we're losing. As long as you keep on battling, that's amazing. I know it's a property now for sale. Vote Councillor Bialik. It's not a pres you know, it's not a problem, but it doesn't happen. Uh, Councillor Branston and then Councillor Hannaford. Thank you. Roger, can, can, can you just tell me an update in regard to the, the issue Toronto Road, which has been going on quite a few times? It's gone here, we've uh, refused it, and now it's come back again. So I, I thought they'd pass the six month limit before they could actually raise that issue. Maybe I'm wrong there, but it, it's well over six months ago. And I just wondered what their grounds for uh, appeal was, and what's the next stage that the council will take now? Yeah, I, I spoke about this on the phone the other day, didn't I? Um, well, actually, if you look into the I, phone, I did, yeah. I asked the case officer to send me a summary of the grounds of appeal and clarify the date of the decision. I haven't had that response from her yet. As soon as, as soon as I get it, I will be in touch. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hallibird. Yes, Chair, on page 182, the land site of Red Hills and West of Hadrian Drive, what is the likely trajectory of that? And I'm assuming, uh, I have an assurance from you that should that come back as a fresh application, it would obviously be coming to committee because that would be extremely controversial. How would Steve We are waiting for it to be confirmed that the original application is appeal has started. It, has, it is a valid appeal that hasn't started. We have a repeat application, and that's been refused under delegated powers for the same reason as the first. It's the exact copy, so we refuse it for the reason we would refuse the first one. We have refused it. And yeah. the final item on the agenda, oh no, well, 11 is the rotor for visits. I can't make that one from all day then. Well, it's your, your well, job you to, to find someone to replace you, Councillor. I find a call. I'm not sure it is. I'm, <laughs> I'm about to tell you it is as part of the rotor. Yeah. If you're unable to attend, please let someone know so we can arrange for somebody else and try and get somebody to replace you. Um, I can't do it either, Councillor Bionic, so it's not particularly helpful, so I can't even offer myself. Uh, in which case, next site inspection is the 23rd of August at 9.30, if it goes ahead. Does anyone who's not Councillor Fold or Councillor Michael Mitchell think they could stand in for Councillor Bionic? Thank you, Councillor Moore. I've solved your problem for you, but, okay? <laughs> Say thank you to Councillor Moore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody for your time and energy this evening. I will see you on next planning committee. Good night.